What's up? What's up? Billy Carson here, aka Forbidden Knowledge. Welcome back. Going to be another great podcast tonight. We'll be talking about and reading about the Epic of Gilgamesh. I promise you that I will come back and do two tablets at a time. Last week I did tablet one and tablet two. People loved it so much. Today I'm here to break down and read tablet three and tablet four from the Epic of Gilgamesh. If you didn't see them um, from last time, I'm just trying to get, put this code in here real quick. Somebody needs this code. Uh, if you didn't see them from, you know, uh, from the last time I talked, or you weren't, you didn't see the video from the last time I talked about it. I'm sorry. Go to last week's podcast where I talked about tablet one and tablet two and, and read the actual Sumerian tablets. This epic is the true and full story of Noah's Ark, okay? The story that's in the biblical text, not even close to being the full story, as well as, unfortunately, not close to even being totally accurate. So what we're finding out here is true, real, ancient history, not fake news history, all right? And the Epic of Gilgamesh is on display at the British Museum. It's a well-known Long, long, long translated text from tablets that were deciphered many, many years ago. We're talking about in the 1800s. So we're not talking about something that's new, that just popped up, that no one knew about. We're talking about the source material for the story of Noah, except Noah's story is a very small piece of a much bigger story. And that's what we're tapping into here. All right. We're tapping into, uh, into the real knowledge. So just in case you never knew what Gilgamesh looked like, I'll give you one of the famous depictions of Gilgamesh. I just had one up here. Let me see if I could find it real quick. Hold on. I want to find this depiction of Gilgamesh um, and his counterpart as well. Let's see if I can uh, get into the folder here. I want to pull this picture up so you guys can see what Gilgamesh look like an Enkidu, Gilgamesh and Enkidu. I'm looking up because I'm looking over the camera now into a giant monitor. Okay, here we go, found one. So I'm gonna show you what the our ancestors depicted Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Enkidu was his counterpart, also a giant, also massive, also highly intelligent, and also a created being. Enkidu was fashioned, according to these tablets, fashioned to be a companion for Gilgamesh to go on his hero's journey. They literally made somebody for him, almost like a cyborg or some type of thing. This guy didn't get born from a womb of a woman. If you remember when we read last week, he literally was created and then put out into the wilderness. Here's a quick shot, here's a quick photo, okay? So you can see here, um, Gilgamesh is holding a full-size line lion in his arms, a full-size lion. He's holding it in his arms, and you can see the size of the full-size lion compared to his actual size. We're talking about this dude is big, okay? You can see the scale here. And there goes his counterpart, Enkidu, which is almost kind of like half human, half type of an animal, mixed animals. But this guy was also extremely strong and, uh, and highly intelligent as well, okay? So we're gonna continue this talk tonight and uh, I'll be reading directly from the actual, uh, from the actual tablets here, all right? So let's get into it. Now, let me open up the tablet. And if, you know, the tablet that I'm reading from is the, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is available in books. I have the book, the translated text, of course, there's tons of universities that have a copy of it online. So you can actually look it up online and read it directly from uh, universities that already exist. And you don't have to pay for it if you don't want to pay for it. But it is available. And the reason why I'm doing this is because, like I said last week, I already know the majority of people will never re read these ancient texts and tablets. You just won't. And it's nothing against you. You have jobs. You got kids. Your kids have sports and other uh, other things that they're into, right? And you got to spread spread your time between that and your kids or 
or whatever other responsibilities you have if you, if you don't have kids. And then you got to eat, you got to sleep. And so the next thing you know, there's no time left for a lot of people to do a lot of research. So I'm here to help you. Okay, I'm here to help you. I'm here to let you hear what some of these tablets have to say. All right. So we're going to start off with tablet three tonight from the Epic of Gilgamesh. All right. Make sure you guys like this video. Please share and like the video. Let me go back to the live chat real quick. Please click the like button. Please share the video. Uh, the book is called The Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, somebody said in the chat, what is the book? The Epic of Gilgamesh. All right. Just like the title of this, this video here. All right. And please make sure you guys share the video. And I'm going to start reading from the Epic of Gilgamesh, Tablet 3. All right. Now, remember, sometimes there's parts in a tablet where the tablet was broken or some of the text that was actually utilized doing a that was created utilizing a, a wedge was, you know, broken off because sometimes parts of these stones get hit or rubbed against or chiseled or in some type of weird way where pieces break off, aging, you know, pieces just fall off. So there are a couple of pieces here or there, and I'll let you know when there's a spot that's missing. And you got to continue to go on past that location. All right. Okay, cool. Let me take a sip of this. All right. Tablet three, the Epic of Gilgamesh. The elders spoke to Gilgamesh saying, Gilgamesh, do not put your trust in your vast strength, but keep your sharp eye out. Make each blow strike in the mark. The one who goes on ahead saves the comrade. The one who knows the route protects his friend. Let Enkidu go ahead of you. He knows the road of the cedar forest. He has seen fighting, has experienced battle. Enkidu will protect the friend, will keep the comrade safe. Let his body urge him back to the wives. In our assembly, we have entrusted the king to you, and your return must and trust the king back to us. And your return, you must entrust the king back to us. Gilgamesh spoke to Enkidu saying, come on, my friend, let us go to the Engla temple. In Ninsun, the great queen, Ninsun is wise, all knowing. She will put the advisable path for our feet. Taking each other by the hand, Gilgamesh and Enkidu walked to the Egla, Eglama, sorry, Eglama, which means great, pa great palace. So Gilgamesh and Enkidu walked to the great El Eglama. Scrolling down here. To Ninsun, the great queen. Ninsun is wise. All knowing, she will put the advisable path at our feet. Taking each other by the hand, Gilgamesh and Enkidu walked to the Eglama. To Ninsun, the great queen, Gilgamesh arose and went to her. Ninsun, even though I am extraordinarily strong, I must now travel a long way to where Humbaba is. If you remember from last week, Humbaba is this technology that has the capability of killing people if they're, if they're caught in the cedar forest doing anything for, for a range of three miles, this thing can detect, I'm sorry, 300 miles. For a range of 300 miles, this object named um, Humbaba can detect rustling of the bushes in the forest. And it can then go from wherever it's at to that exact location like this and annihilate whoever it is that's messing, in, messing around inside the forest. Because Enlil put this guard Humbaba there to guard the forest against, against anyone coming to cut any of the trees down. He owned that forest and he didn't want the trees touched. And when you when, when we read the description of Humbaba last week, we discovered that it's not a person. It's some type of technology that has the capability of slaying men with flames and fire. Pretty crazy stuff. I must face fighting such as that, such as I no, I must face fighting such as I have not known. And I must travel on the road that I do not know. Until the time that I go and return, until I reach the cedar forest, 
until I kill Umbaba, the terrible, and eradicate from the land something baneful that Shamash hates. Intercede with Shamash on my behalf. If I kill Umbaba and cut his cedar, let there be rejoicing all over the land, and I will erect a monument of the victory before you. So he's talking, so Gilgamesh is talking to the Anunnaki god named Shamash. Now there's a, a famous tablet called the Tablet of Shamash. And this tablet has a depiction of Shamash on the tablet along with three more humans. You could tell that he's not human because he's sitting down. And even though he's sitting, he's like three times taller than the people. And what's crazy is Shamash is sitting on a type of a box that has a symbol for magnetic fields on it. And then he's got this arch kind of a tripod coming up and over, which is right above this gigantic stone table. And then you see a human being standing in front of the stone table, holding it up with one hand. Okay. Now this is incredible. Above the table, there's a disc. That disc has lines in it. For many years, people thought that was pottery or some type of a design. But more recently, I discovered about four and a half years ago, it's a frequency. It's a cymatic frequency that you can make on a Cladney plate. I made a famous post about this. It went uber viral for months. It did millions of views. And I played the actual sound frequency and I put a warning on my post that says sound warning because it's a very high pitched sound. But when you activate that frequency with a magnetic field, it creates anti-gravity. Matter of fact, while I got you guys up here and we're getting into this and we're just kind of really freshly starting out, let me pull up the tablet of Shamash real quick and show you what I'm talking about. Okay. The tablet of Shamash. And let me just try to put an image up on the screen for you really fast so you can see exactly what I'm talking about before we go on. All right. Let's see here. And let me see if I can open it up on the screen for you guys. Just bear with me a second. I think this is really, really, really important. All right. So now, here we go. All right. So this is the tablet of Shamash. Let me get this off the screen. Now you can clearly see uh, this tablet is literally showing you what I was saying. You see this box that he's sitting on, on the right-hand side. That is positive and, and negative. That's that's a field. We're talking about magnetism here. In his hand, he has an oscillator, what I would consider in electronics an oscillator. Off, off of this tripod or this arm that's hanging, you see this disc. This disc actually has what? It has lines. Those lines make a specific frequency that you can get at a specific tone and pitch. And then you see the humans. The humans are there. And what are the humans doing? The one in the front is holding up the table off the ground with one hand. He's lifting it. This is depicting the Anunnaki beings imparting the wisdom of anti-gravity to mankind. Very famous tablet called the Tablet of Shamash. I wrote about this tablet in my book, my new book, which I will show you now, The, ep uh, the uh, Epic of Humanity, okay? The Epic of Humanity by Billy Carson and Matthew LaCroix. I talk about the Tablet of Shamash and so many other tablets in here, along with Matthew LaCroix. We touch on over 200,000 years of human history in this one book, and it's available on Amazon. And the link, of course, is in the caption of this video as well. I'll be talking about this book a little bit more later also. All right. So let's get into this. Uh, let me get back to the tablet. All right. So now, Ninsun, even though I'm extraordinarily strong, I must now travel a long way to where Umbaba is. I must face fighting such as I have not known. I must travel on the road that I do not know until the time that I go and return, until I reach the cedar forest, until I kill Umbaba the terrible. 
and eradicate from the land something baneful that Shamash hates. Intercede with Shamash on my behalf. If I kill Umbaba and cut his cedar, let there be rejoicing all over the land, and I will erect a monument of the victory before you. The words of Gilgamesh, her son. Grieving Queen Ninsun heard over and over. Ninsun went into her living quarters. She washed herself with the purity plant. She donned a robe worthy of her body. She donned jewels worthy of her chest. She donned her sash, put on her crown. She sprinkled water from a bowl onto the ground. She went and up went to the roof. That's what it says. She went and up went to the roof. She went up to the roof and set incense in front of, in front of Shamash. I, she, offered fragrant cuttings and raised her arms to Shamash. Why have you imposed, nay, inflicted a restless heart on my son Gilgamesh? Now you have touched him so that he wants to travel a long way to where Umbaba is. He will face fighting such as he has not known. He will travel on the road that he does not know until he goes away and, and returns, until he reaches the cedar forest, until he kills Umbaba the terrible and eradicates from the land something baneful that you hate. On the day that you see him on the road, my Aha, the bride, without fear, remind you and command also the watchmen of the night, the stars, and the night your father seen. There's something missing here. And then she says, she, and then it says, she banked up the incense and uttered the ritual words. She called to Enkidu and would give him instructions. Enkidu the mighty, you are not of my womb, but now I speak to you along with the sacred vultures of Gilgamesh, the high priestess, the holy woman, the temple servers. She laid a pendant on Enkidu's neck. The high priestess took and the daughters of the gods I have taken Enkidu. There's a couple of missing words here. Enkidu to Gilgamesh I have taken until he goes and returns, until he reaches the cedar forest. Be it a month, be it a year. Then we have 11 lines missing here. The gate of cedar, Enkidu, in the temple of Shamash. In the Eglama, he made an offering and cuttings. So what's interesting here is that Shamash isn't there in the physical form. He, they, have, they know of, this, of him. They've seen him. They have depictions of him, but they have statues of him, of him as well. And at this point, they're bringing offerings and incense and getting themselves cleaned and, and uh, you know, to pre present it properly in front of what they considered a god. To, to, you know, at least his mom is to ask for guidance and uh, give him some type of grace and safety and so forth and so on. So, this is what's going on here. And so, Enkidu in the Temple of Samash and Gilgamesh in Eglama, he made an offering of cuttings to the sons of the king. And then there's about 60 lines missing on this tablet. Then it says, Enkidu will protect the friend, will keep the comrade safe. Let his body urge him back to the wives. In other words, let him, when he goes out to fight and to battle, let his mind be on coming back to his wives, his family, right? So that uh, that drives him to want to succeed, to be able to make it back home. In our assembly, we have entrusted the king to you. And on your return, you must entrust the king back to us. Enkidu spoke to Gil Gilgamesh saying, my friend, turn back. The road, and then there are a few last lines missing here on tablet number three, okay? So that's tablet number three, and we're going to go over to tablet number four. But before we do that, I want to show you guys something amazing here, something amazing. Check this out. I think it's really, really dope. Let's see if I can find it here. All right. Mm -hmm.
forbidden knowledge. All right. And so all of our books are available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com and they're also available on Amazon. And our books are bestsellers, except for one book. The only book that's not a bestseller is the Manifest Destiny Journal. It's really just a journal. It's not really a book. And so what's amazing is these books are all bestsellers. The Epic of Humanity, which just came out a few weeks ago, reached number two out of 32.5 million books on Amazon and is a bestseller right now, number one in three categories. And of course, the Emerald Tablets of, uh, that I wrote about the Emerald I wrote about the Emerald Tablets. So the book is called Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. And it's a breaking down of the knowledge and wisdom inside the Emerald Tablets. This book is a bestseller in ancient civilizations or ancient Egyptian civilizations. Go so check it out. The link is in the, in the uh, chat as well as in the caption of this video. All right. So uh, thank you. I see a few, a few people brought my new book. Thank you so much. My new book is now on pre-order. I'll be doing autographed uh, pre-orders. And I want to pull that book up here real quick before I go into tablet number four. Uh, this book is going to be a game changer. It's a book about the fractal holographic universe written by me. And it's really done in a way I took a lot of energy to do this book in a way where I don't like to say the average person, because to me, that's putting people down. But people that may not be well versed in um, in quantum physics and supersymmetry and theoretical physics and uh, specific types of mathematics, um, like vortex mathematics and things like that, I'm breaking it down in a way that I feel most people will be able to understand it. And then I go and I actually um, bring the metaphysics and the philosophy as well. So um, it's a combination of quantum physics, quantum mechanics, broken down in a way that you can understand, supersymmetry, as well as also uh, metaphysics and philosophy. And it's a combination of all of that in one book to explain uh, the fractal holographic universe, because I'm going to reveal the matrix. This is the book. Yeah, I want to see you guys in the live chat. Tell me what you think about the cover. And thanks to everyone who did get their book already. I appreciate y'all so much. All right. Fractal holographic universe, the matrix code revealed. And uh, this book is going to literally open your eyes to understand what it is exactly that we're living in and what we're a part of. All right. The fractal holographic universe. I'm really happy and pleased to be able to teach this. Yes, I do cover the Adinkra codes in here as well. I see somebody asking about that in the live chat. I'm talking about the Adinkra codes from the Dogon tribe. I'm talking about all the knowledge from all around the world, from indigenous cultures worldwide that already knew that we're living in a fractal holographic matrix and what this matrix is made of, how it's made, what, how it's designed, and what is the programming code. I have a little secret code right by my eye on this photo, right underneath my eye and right down my neck. There's a mathematical code in this image on my book cover, which you'll see when you get the book. But you can also see it here if you have your screens big enough. That is the Mandelbrot set that that small formula creates everything that we see in the known universe. So I've got the code. So the matrix code revealed, all right? It's gonna be an amazing book. Uh, I'm so pleased to be you know, done with it. Now it's in editing and pre-orders and every single pre-order gets autographed, just like I did the other book, The Epic of Humanity. So all the pre-orders, you go to the link, you go to forbiddenknowledge.com, put in your pre-order for the book and you will be able to, uh, you will be able to get an autographed copy from me I copy, I, I, I autograph it myself with a real pen, okay? Some people don't do that. They just reprint the autograph into every single book. I don't do that. I'm gonna drop the exact link here real quick to the to the uh, pre-order book, and then I'm gonna go on to tablet number four, okay? So I just hang tight. But yeah, it'll be a real autograph. You'll, you'll see videos of me sitting down, signing a stack of books like I did the last time with the Epic of Humanity and getting that book ready to... Uh, to send out. 
and then it'll go it'll be up on amazon it'll be on our site it'll be everywhere but I'm, I'm right for right now i'm only going to autograph for right now all these pre-orders as a, as a special thank you for the people who had to order it in ahead, ahead of time and then have to wait a little while all right so thank you okay let me pull this image down the fractal holographic universe Whew. my greatest lecture that i ever did um, outside of ancient civilizations was my fractal holographic universe lecture. It was a three and a half hour lecture that I did in California in 2017, I believe, at Contact in the Desert. And um, that, that, that was just really, what a great lecture. After I did that lecture and I saw the response that I got, it would think it was about 400 people in that room. Everyone gave me a standing ovation. I realized then I needed to put that into a book. And fast forward years later, I finally said, you know what, I got to get this thing done. So I jumped on it and um, have been working on it. And what I like about the field of knowledge and work that I'm in, you, I mean, you have to have the knowledge. I mean, there's no chat GPT that's going to write these books. <laughs> you can't, you know, there's no chat GPT that's going to write these books. Woke doesn't mean broke, right? That's my financial literacy book, 688 pages. If I didn't shrink the fonts in here, it would have been a thousand pages, All right? We got that. We got the Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, Ancient Civilizations, right? Epic of Humanity, also dealing with ancient civilizations and its effect on our current state of the world today. And then now we have Fractal Holographic Universe. So now we're talking more about in the arena of sciences, um, you know, so, just a varying array of, of, uh, of information. And I love the fact that I can put out topics that people can vibe with on various different topics because not everybody's into just ancient civilization. Not everybody's into financial literacy. I can put books out in so many different areas that will resonate with so many different people and give them something to grab onto, something to add to their knowledge base. So I'm really excited about that, all right? Okay, cool. So let me get back to tablet number four. All right, we're going to start off on tablet number four now. Let me get back up here. Tablet four. Let me just highlight this because this tablet writing is so faint. Sometimes you can't see it that well. So I, what I do is I highlight it with the cursor to put the dark blue behind it so I can make the, the light faint wording pop a little bit better. All right, tablet four, the Epic of Gilgamesh. At 20 leagues, they broke for some food. Okay, so now Gilgamesh and Enkidu are off on their journey. At 20 leagues, they said, you know what? They got to take a break. It's time to eat some food. 20 leagues is, um, that is quite a bit of ways because I believe a league is 100 miles, right? Let me just verify that for you real quick. I believe a league is 100 miles. I just want to verify. How many miles is that? I believe it's 100, but I just want to make sure. Let's make sure I get it right. Okay, sorry. One league is 3.45 miles, so 20 leagues. Basically, what they're saying here is um, 70 miles, roughly. Okay? Not too bad. So 70 miles. All right. So 70 miles in on foot, they said they finally ready to take a break. And that just gives you an idea of how strong these people were. I mean, think about that. I, I go for walks on the beach. I do my meditation walks. They're five mile meditation walks. And by the time I get to that fifth mile, I mean, I'm, I'm still full of energy and I'm not limping by any means. But I'm ready to, you know, take a nice shower, cool off, you know, get cleaned up. These guys walk 70 miles in the woods to say, now it's time to take a break. After five miles, I'm starving. I can only imagine. So these people have incredible strength and incredible resilience. At 30 leagues, they stop for the night. So they went another 10 leagues on top of that. Then they stopped for the night. Walking 50 leagues in the whole day, a walk of a month and a half. 
Wow. A walk of a month and a half. That's incredible. On the third day, they drew near to the Lebanon. They dug a well facing Shamash, the setting sun. So there again is more worship of these Anunnaki beings that aren't really there on site, but they're giving reverence to them. So they're giving them reverence to the god Shamash because they want the blessings of Shamash to be able to allow them to celebrate when they kill this Umbaba and start cutting down these trees and everything. They dug a well facing Shamash, the setting sun. Gilgamesh climbed up a mountain peak, made a libation of flour and said, mountain, bring me a dream, a favorable message from Shamash. Enkidu prepared a sleeping place for him for the night. A violent wind passed through, so he attached a covering. He made him lie down, and in a circle, they, like a grain from the mountain, I know it sounds weird, but there's a few words missing, while Gilgamesh rested his chin on his knees. Sleep that pours over mankind overtook him. In the middle of the night, his sleep came to an end. So he got up and said to his friend, my friend, did you not call out to me? Why did I not wake up? Did you not touch me? Why am I so disturbed? Did a God pass by? Why are my muscles trembling? And so Enkidu replies to him and says, Enkidu, my friend, I have had a dream. I'm sorry, Gilgamesh is talking, Gilgamesh is talking to Enkidu. Enkidu, my friend, I had a dream. And the dream I had was deeply disturbing. In the mountain gorges, the mountain fell down upon us, wet like flies. A few words missing. He who was born in the wilderness. He's talking about Enkidu because he was born in the wilderness. Enkidu interpreted the dream for his friend. My friend, your dream is favorable. The dream is extremely important. My friend, the mountain which you saw in the dream is Humbaba. It means we will capture Humbaba and kill him and throw his corpse into the wasteland. In the morning, there will be a favorable message from Shamash. At 20 leagues, they broke for some food. At 30 leagues, they stopped for the night. Walking 50 leagues in a whole day, a walk of a month and a half. Wow. So they're, they're three months out now. They're three months out walking to get to this location to try to kill this Umbaba. So then it says, they dug a well facing Shamash. Gilgamesh climbed up a mountain peak, made a libation of flour and said, mountain, bring me a dream, a favorable message from Shamash. Enkidu prepared a sleeping place for him for the night. A violent wind passed through, so he attached a covering. He made him lie down in a circle. They, like grain from the mountain, while Gilgamesh rested his chin on his knees, sleep that pours over mankind overtook him. In the middle of the night, his sleep came to an end. So he got up and said to his friend, my friend, did you not call out to me? Why did I not wake up? Did you not touch me? Why am I so disturbed? Did a God pass by? Why are my muscles trembling? Enkidu, my friend, I have a dream. Besides my first dream, a second. And the dream I had, so striking, so disturbing, I was grappling with the wild bull of the wilderness. With the bellow, he split the ground and cloud of dust to the sky. Sounds a little strange because there's, there's a few words missing there. I sank to my knees in front of him. He holds that encircled my arm. So a few words missing. My tongue hung out. My temples throbbed. He gave me water to drink from his water skin. My friend, the God to whom we go, is not the wild bull. He is totally different. The wild bull you saw is Shamash, the protector. In difficulties, he holds our hand. The one who gave you water to drink is his water skin. God, he's the God who brings honor to you. Lugal Banda, 
we should join together and do one thing, a deed such has never been done before in the land. At 20 leagues, they broke for some food. At 30 leagues, they stopped for the night, walking 50 leagues the whole day, a walk of a month and a half. Wow. They're out there now. They're way, 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 way out there. I got to highlight this part here. Hold on. So I can see it a little bit better. All right. There's a long tablet. Walking 50 leagues in a whole day, a walk of a month and a half. So they're out four and a half months now walking. They dug a well facing Shamash. Gilgamesh climbed up a mountain peak, made a libation of flour and said, mountain, bring me a dream, a favorable message from Shamash. Enkidu prepared a sleeping place for him for the night. A violent wind passed through, so he attached a covering. He made him lie down and in a circle, they like grain from the mountain, while Gilgamesh rested his chin on his knees. Sleep that pours over mankind overtook him. In the middle of the night, his sleep came to an end. So he got up and said to his friend, my friend, you did not call out to me. Why did I not wake up? Did you not touch me? Why am I so disturbed? Did a God pass by? Why are my muscles trembling? Enkidu, my friend, I have had a third dream. A dream I had was deeply disturbing. The heavens roared and the earth rumbled. Then it became deathly still and darkness loomed. A bolt of lightning cracked and fire broke out, and where it kept thickening, there reigned death. Then the white hot name dimmed, and the fire went out, and everything had been falling around turned to ash. Let us go down into the plan, and let us go down into the plain so we can talk it over. Enkidu heard the dream, and he said, He had presented and said to Gilgamesh, 40 lines here. A couple of words and 40 lines are missing. At 20 leagues, they broke for some food. At 30 leagues, they stopped for the night, walking 50 leagues the whole day, a walk of a month and a half. They dug a well facing Shamash. Gilgamesh climbed up the peak, made a libation of flour and said, Mountain, bring me a dream, a favorable message from Shamash. Hankinu prepared a sleeping place for him for the night. A violent wind passed through, so he attached a covering. He made him lie down, and in a circle, they like the grain from the mountain, while Gilgamesh rested his chin on his knees. Slept that sleep that pours over mankind overtook him. In the middle of the night, his sleep his sleep came to an end. So he got up and said to his friend, "My friend, did you not call out to me? Why did I not wake up? Did you not touch me? Why am I so disturbed? Did a god pass by?" Why are my muscles trembling? Enkidu, my friend, I have had a fourth dream, and the dream I had was deeply disturbing. There's about 11 lines missing. He says, it was cubits tall. Gilgamesh, Enkidu listened to his dream. The dream that you had was favorable. It is extremely important, my friend. This, Umbaba, Iki, before it becomes light. We will achieve victory over him, Umbaba against whom we rage. We will triumph over him. We will triumph over him. In the morning, there will be favorable message from Shamash. At 20 leagues, they broke for some food. At 30 leagues, they stopped for the night, walking 50 leagues the whole day, a walk of a month and a half. They dug a well facing Shamash. Gilgamesh climbed up the mountain peak, made a libation of flour and said, Mountain, bring me a dream a favorable message from Shamash. Enkidu prepared a sleeping place for him for the night. A violent wind passed through, so he attached a covering. He made him lie down and in a circle, lay like the grain from the mountain, while Gilgamesh rested his chin on his knees. Sleep that pours over mankind overtook him. In the middle of the night, his sleep came to an end, so he got up and said to his friend, my friend, did you not call out to me? Why did I not wake up? Did you not touch me? Why am I so disturbed? Did a God pass by? Why are my muscles trembling? Thank you, do, my friend. I had a fifth dream, and this dream I was deeply disturbing. It was deeply disturbing. His tears were running in the presence of Shamash. What you said in the rook, be mindful of it. 
Stand by me. Gilgamesh, the offspring of a rook haven, Shamash heard what issued from his mouth. And suddenly there resounded a warning sound from the sky. Hurry and stand by him so that Umbaba does not enter the forest and does not go down into the thickets and hide. He has not put on his seven coats of armor. He is wearing only one, but has taken off six. They, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, they lunge at each other like raging wild bulls. One name he bellowed full of. The guardian of the forest bellowed Umbaba like one alone cannot. They're talking about, and now they're engaging this Umbaba character who's coming to kill them because he could detect that there was something going on in the forest. Okay. The guardian of the forest bellowed Umbaba like one alone cannot. Strangers, a slippery path is not feared by two people who help each other. Twice, three times, a three-ply rope cannot be cut. The mighty lioness cubs can roll him over. Enkidu spoke to Gilgamesh saying, as soon as we have gone into the cedar forest, let us split open a tree and strip off its branches. Gilgamesh spoke to Enkidu saying, why my friend, we so wretchedly, few words are missing, we have crossed over the mountains together in front of us, before we have cut down the cedar, my friend, you are so experienced in battle. Who's fighting? A couple of words missing here. You need not fear death. Let your voice bellow forth like a kettle drum. Let the stiffness in your arms depart. Let the paralysis in your legs go away. Take my hand, my friend. We will go together. Your heart should burn to a battle. Pay no heed to death. Do not lose heart. The one who watches from the side is a careful man, but the one who walks in front protects himself and saves his comrade. And though they're fighting, and through their fighting, they establish fame. As the two of them reached the evergreen forest, they cut off their talk and stood still. So in tablet number four, let me just get back to the main screen here now. So what's going on here is, so these two guys are obviously going through the forest. They're heading to the cedar forest to, to chop down some trees and kill Umbaba. And this is all along the way where the main part of the story is that Gilgamesh ends up learning about Zia Zudra, who is actually Noah from the Bible. We're going to get into that probably in the next couple of tablets. And so he's trying, he discovers that there's some type of immortality elixir, and he wants to get that immortality um, elixir. He wants to get it in his hands. He wants to take it. He wants to find out how he can become immortal. He knows that he's not 100% human, and he also knows that he's not 100% Anunnaki. He knows that he's a mixed breed, and he wanted to find out if there's any way possible that he can, um, that he can get some advice uh, on how he can become immortal, okay? And I think he even wanted to go back to the home planet as well. So it's a pretty interesting, it gets really interesting. Now, this part of the, the, the reading is a little dry because it's the journey. I mean, these guys are walking, as you can see, for months and months and months to get to their destination so they can, uh, uh, I guess, tag team this Umbaba and try to break it, destroy it, or kill it uh, before it kills them. And then they're going to make a monument out of cedar. And then they got to walk all the way back <laughs> another half a year to get back home to their kingdom, where Gilgamesh is king, to Uruk, and actually let everyone know they defeated Umbaba and it's time to celebrate. So it's pretty interesting. Now, this Shamash is being worshipped a lot. But what's interesting is this Enlil, who's known as Yahweh in the Bible, he seems to be alive and still interacting and engaging mankind because from the beginning, he had given uh, Gilgamesh the approval to go on this journey and then fashioned him this, uh, this being, this, uh, this, this partner that he had, he's, his comrade that he's going out there with. So Enlil is still around. This Anunnaki being is still around, but Shamash is only being worshipped. But he, they, in remembrance of him, they're worshipping him and honoring him 
They must have really loved this guy. He must have, from their perspective, treated them well. Uh, so pretty interesting story. Okay. I know I have a little. Okay. I fixed the lag. I promise you guys I'm going to fix the lagging problem. There's something wrong with my um, my soundboard that's creating that lag. So I'm getting it all straightened up. All right. Uh, but yeah, so it's pretty cool. It's an incredible story. It really is uh, the oldest text that you can that you can find that's going to lead you to find out more about Noah. And like I said before, the more you read into it as we get deeper into these tablets, I'm going to come back and do tablet uh, five and six next. Um, but you'll find that Noah Noah was uh, a half breed. He was half human. And half Anunnaki, I believe his father was in uh, Ea Enki. And so Enki wanted to spare him because it was his son. Um, and he gave him instructions on how to build an ark, but the ark that he built is not the one that's in the Bible. We have the actual ark tablet. The ark tablet exists, and we're going to read that tablet separately as well during this process of me reading the Epic of Gilgamesh. And I'm going to show you what that ark looks like. It's a disc, it's not a giant boat, like people thought it was. And yes, he was not told to go get two of every kind of animal from all over the world and put on this boat. Didn't happen. That, that's a fairy tale that they're still teaching in school. He was told to get his local flora and fauna and his local cattle and whatever herbs, he, whatever small amount of things he had around his, his area, his, his land, his farm, whatever you want to call it, um, his estate, to put them on this this round disc shaped um, boat that he was ordered to build for lack of a word, I call it a boat. I don't know what it was, a submersible. I don't know what it was, but it, it definitely didn't look like a boat that would sail out on the ocean like we would think. And um, yeah, two, uh, you know, two cockroaches and two fleas and, and two mosquitoes and all that, 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 that didn't happen. That, that, two lions and two giraffes and, and all that kind of stuff never happened. All right. They didn't have two jaguars and two cheetahs coming on to the doggone boat, filling up the boat with two kinds of birds, you know, two blue jays and two hummingbirds and all that. It didn't happen. It did not happen. What did happen was he got his local stuff that he had right around his house that he can replant some seeds and some, some, some plants that he can literally, you know, you can snap them off in a certain way where you can replant them. Um, he probably had some livestock that he took with him as well. That was his own. And that was it. Okay. That was literally it. So it's pretty interesting. So we're going to get into that. It'll, it'll be deeper in the story. For those of you who know about our tour of Egypt, we did quite a few videos talking about Egypt recently. We had testimonials of people who went on tour with us to come up and talk about how much fun they had on the tour and what a life-changing experience that it was for them. Uh, and uh, if you want, you can go back on this, on this account and you can look at some of the last few videos we did where we had testimonials for Egypt and for Cambodia and for the ARC program as well. You can check out those testimonial videos and also check out this clip from our last tour of Egypt. One, two, three. <laughs>
This is Jimmy Church. Please visit and explore Egypt this October 3rd through the 14th, 2024 with Billy, Elizabeth, myself, and very special guest, Matt LaCroix. It's simple to do. Just go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com and click on Upcoming Tours or click on the link below. We'll see you there. That tour was amazing coming up this year. We only have a few spots left for the forbidden tour of Egypt. We have private visits. Private visits means when we show up, meaning the forbidden family shows up at a particular site, the tourists have to get out. No tourists allowed. We go in there. It's our place now. The pyramids, we clear out the entire Giza plateau. Nobody's there. We'll go into the Great Pyramid and do a special meditation for a couple of hours inside the Great Pyramid. You know, the average person goes halfway around the world, spends 20, 30 hours flying just to see the pyramids. And when they get there, sometimes they can't even get inside. And when they do get inside, they're inside and they're out in just a few minutes. We're going to spend time inside the pyramids. We're going to go to the Red Pyramid, the Bent Pyramid, climb down the shaft into the Bent Pyramid, and then ascend upwards inside the Bent Pyramid to the apex from the inside. And I'll show you how it's made using advanced technology and exactly what it was used for. It's going to blow your mind. And then we're going to go out into um, uh, on, a, on a Nile cruise, which will take us all the way up the Nile, stopping at major sites along the way like Luxor, Kamambo, Edfu Temple, Karnak. Um, we're going to go to the Temple of Dendera. We're going to go to the um, uh, Temple of Seti at Abydos and go down into the Osirian. I mean, just amazing places that most people will never get a chance to see. And they try to maybe put it in a four trips of a lifetime to get there to see all these things. We're going to see it in 12 days on a super VIP private tour. And then guess what? I'll be doing lectures seven days in a row on the boat. I was sailing down the Nile, seven lectures in seven days, and so will our special guest, Matthew LaCroix. We'll have Matthew LaCroix, best-selling author Matthew LaCroix, who co-wrote the book with me, The Epic of Humanity, all right? So it's going to be an amazing tour. If you want more information, I'm dropping the link here. That's a few spots left. Make sure you register ASAP, and our next tour is also Turkey. So we have Turkey in September, and then we have Egypt in October. 10-day tour of Turkey is going to be mind-blowing. We're taking you to Gobekli Tepe. We're taking you to Karahan Tepe. We're taking you to Derun Kuyu. We're going to descend 12 stories down underground in a super ancient underground city built to save the lives of 30,000 people thousands of years ago. 14,000 ventilation shafts bringing air to the deepest levels. How did they make this? How did they cut ventilation shafts just a few inches wide to go down 12 stories in in particular angles to make sure the air flows and keep the circulation of oxygen equal throughout the entire structure in ancient times? It's mind-blowing. Looking forward to doing that grand tour of Turkey as well. I'm going to drop the Turkey link for anyone who's interested in coming to Turkey with me. We're going to celebrate my my birthday in Turkey. Let me get that Turkey link real quick. Uh, Where is it here? Turkey tour. Boom. We'll celebrate my birthday on September the 4th. September the 4th in Egypt. All right. Turkey tour. I'm going to type it into the chat right now. But you can check that tour out as well. Another great and incredible forbidden tour. People love our tours. They get to hang out with me and Elizabeth. It's like we're just good old buddies from from years ago, just hanging out, talking, having fun, joking with each other, eating together, talking together. People ask me a lot of questions. (laughs) I answer as many as I possibly can. You know, lectures every single day. It's like going on an ancient conference, you know, and, and just, it's incredible. And the friends that you make on these tours are lifelong friends. 
literally lifelong friends. Thank you, Sin uh, Sinexo Art. Appreciate you. So just pre-ordered the uh, Fractal Holographic Universe book. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And to everyone else that also pre-ordered as well. All right. So Turkey tour, Egypt tour, that's 2024. We're going to be posting our 2025 tours very soon because those are also going to start taking bookings because these things book out so fast. We're going to give people enough chance to book them in advance. Some people were saying they can make it to the 2025, but they can't make the 24. Also, we're going to take one person for free. So one person is going to get a scholarship. And I do call it a scholarship because we're giving you knowledge. Okay. It's not a sponsorship. It's a scholarship. And if you want a chance to win the scholarship to go to Egypt at our expense, you have to text Egypt to 954-245-0086. Text Egypt to 954-245-0086. And the only thing that's not covered is your flight to Egypt and your flight back home. But the flights in Egypt, the Nile cruise in Egypt, the hotels, which are five star, like the Four Seasons, we're sitting at the Four Seasons in Egypt, covered. Meals, covered. Entrance to these sites, covered. So if you want to get a scholarship, again, text hashtag Egypt to, I'm going to type it in the chat too as well, hashtag Egypt to 954-245-0086. This is the first year we're going to give one person a scholarship to come to Egypt with us. First time we're ever doing this. One person is going to get a scholarship to come to Egypt. All right. I just dropped it in the live chat. And again, you see it up there on the screen. All right. I'm going to pull that down now. 954-245-0086. One person is going to be fortunate enough to get a scholarship to come to Egypt with us and have a phenomenal, phenomenal time. It's going to be great. We're really looking forward to this tour. I believe this tour is going to be even better than last year's because what we did was we got 12 days on the Nile cruise. Usually most tours are three days now. And with three days now, you have more time in drive, driving in the desert on buses, on roads that don't exist. <laughs> and that's very hard on the body doing that for four or five hours a day sometimes six hours a day, depending on going and then coming back. And so when you take the pressure off with the cruise, it's better. So we cruise down the Nile to more destinations and the buses rendezvous with us at those actual ports. And then we only got 10 minute rides to the actual tourist attraction versus riding in the bus for six, seven hours total time. So it's saving some stress on the body. We decided to do it this way this time. We got brand new cruise ships, brand new tour buses with bathrooms on them. You're riding in a lap of luxury. You're sailing in a lap of luxury, imported chefs, imported food to make sure we have the best and most, most healthiest and safest meals. And we're staying only at five-star hotels. Okay, in Egypt, in Cairo, we're at the Four Seasons, of course, which the food there is phenomenal. And then we have to hop on a plane and fly to Luxor, uh, we're going to stay at a nice, very nice five-star hotel there. Uh, and the buses will rendezvous with us. They'll drive all the way to Luxor and rendezvous with us. And they'll bring your luggage and everything with, with them on the bus. So when you get to Luxor, no need to lugging all this luggage around and everything else. We have all your luggage brought all the way from Cairo to Luxor. All you do is walk to your, uh, walk up to the desk, get your key, grab your luggage, and go to your room. See, we made it so easy for everyone. It's going to be an amazing tour, something that you don't want to miss, all right? It's going to be mind-blowing. And before I wrap up tonight, don't forget, we are in round three of raising funds for forbidden knowledge. It's a golden opportunity if you want to be able to take advantage of that. Check this out. Hey everyone, it's Billy Carson here, AKA Forbidden Knowledge. If you've ever wanted to invest in a company that's going places, you need to take a look at us. 
Remember, in round one, shares were only a dollar each as our pre-money valuation came in at $20 million. Not bad for a startup, right? We did phenomenal numbers months later where our pre-money valuation went up to $30 million and share prices went up to $1.50, looking really good for the investors. And our pre-money valuation is now $50 million as we've continued to grow and expand the company. Share prices have gone up again to $2.50. If you've ever wanted to get involved with a company that's going places, that's building, that's growing and expanding, if you ever wanted to earn and learn, you should look at Forbidden Knowledge. Make sure you click the link, read up on all the information about us to make an educated decision to join the Forbidden Knowledge family today. All right, cool. I saw somebody in the chat say, I think Billy Carson's AI. No, I'm not AI. I'm just intelligent as hell. I'm probably one of the smartest people you ever listened to in your life, literally. And you hardly are going to be, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody else out there like me. There's very few. And that's just, that ain't bragging. That's just a fact. So I remember when I first launched Forbidden Knowledge, I only had the Forbidden Knowledge logo on the screen, right? Um, and so on the screen was the Forbidden logo which was the Eye of Horus. That was my original logo. And then I had my separate account, Billy Carson. And so my Billy Carson account, of course, I had my face. I, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was me. But I was dropping a lot of my knowledge on the forbidden knowledge, just starting from 2011 all the way through. But when we got to about 2014 or 15, I began to realize more people were going to start seeing me on TV shows. So I was like, you know what? Yeah, I got to... I want to show my face. So I decided to just put my face up and take the logo down and put my face up on my account. I never forget that day. <laughs> I never forget that day. People were freaking out in the, in the uh, comments. This guy hacked the account. No way a black guy has this kind of knowledge. And by the way, white people weren't saying that. It was black people saying that. No way a black, no way this black guy has this kind of knowledge. He stole this account from an Asian person. I mean, the, 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 the stuff that they were saying was just was outrageous. Let me see if I can get to this. Uh, thank you, M. Tooley, as well, for the donation. I missed you, M. Tooley. You're probably way up there somewhere. You gave a donation, and I missed you while I was reading. Oh, here it goes. I got you. Boom. All right. Appreciate you. Thank you, M. Tooley. And thank you, KNDN724. Thank you so much. And so I just never forget that because I was dying laughing. I, and I was also kind of in shock, like, you know, you know like I'm, I'm I, a black guy is not supposed to know a lot of things. I'm supposed to, I guess I'm supposed to be dumb and want to smoke weed and hang out and pimp hoes and slap people upside the head and pistol whip people. I guess that's, that's what I, that's the vibe that I was getting from these crazy people. But anyway, thankfully that ain't me. Um, you know, when, when some of you guys were still trying to figure out how to go to a potty, I was already reading novels. My first novel that I read, I was a toddler, and that was um, uh, the, the Sea Wolf by Jack London. OK, that was my first novel that I read while people were still trying to figure out how to go potty. All right, I was walking at 10 months and already reading simple books at 10 months. And by the time I was two, I was reading full regular books. My dad started making me do book reports at the age of three. So I'm talking about on everything, whatever book we had around Bibles. I was doing book reports on Bibles. Most people don't even know how to do a book report. They don't even know the format for a book report. I was doing that since I was a little kid. And that's why I dedicated my book, Woke Doesn't Mean Broke, to my father. Because even though he was a crazy son of a bee, one thing he realized was my aptitude for retaining knowledge. And so that's why I'm gonna read my dedication to my father right here, real quick. I dedicated this book to him because to be honest with you, if it wasn't for him doing that, this book might not exist. This is a dedication to my father, Billy Carson Sr. <clears throat> I dedicate this book to my father, Billy Carson Sr. 
Although we didn't always see eye to eye, he instilled a hard work ethic in me. From the early age of only one years old, I was writing weekly book reports. By the age of 12, my parents required me to pay rent and to live, required me to pay rent to live in the family home. I was also required to use my own money to pay for most of my daily needs. Can you imagine asking your 12 year old to do that right now? They're gonna look at you like you're crazy. But that's what happened to me. I had to pay rent at the age of 12. While this would have had an adverse effect on most children, it drove me. This work ethic pushed me to become an innovative thinker and entrepreneur. For this reason, I thank you, Dad. You saw something in me and you used your own methods to extract it and teach me how to become my own savior. I love you, Pops. Rest in power. Okay. So it's my dad, Billy Carson Sr. Unfortunately, he was killed by cops. So, yeah, that's a few uh, now, five years ago. Anyway, that's why I dedicated that book to my dad. My other book, The Compendium of the Animal Tablets, I dedicated to my mom. I'm going to read that one real quick and I'm going to hop off of here. I dedicate this book to the memory of my mother. She's also passed away. Ingrid Carson. She told me about the Nazca lines and Machu Picchu in the 1970s. My mother believes they may have been remnants of an ancient airport. Visiting these ancient sites and ruins became one of the driving forces behind my research and travels. In 2018, I fulfilled my dreams of researching and visiting Peru where I witnessed all of its wonders. I love you, mom, rest in power. So, so I dedicated these two books to my parents. My mom knew about Anunnaki in the seventies. She told me that there were more advanced beings than us on this planet and everything that we have now is only a rediscovery of what already existed in the 1970s, my mom told me that. Unfortunately, my mom passed away in 2011 from uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, one of the worst ways to die because your brain turns on every nerve in your body and they burn 24 hours a day until the nerves burn out. When the nerves burn out, no signal can get to the muscle. And when the muscles can't get any signal, they atrophy. Eventually the last muscle or automatic movement is your diaphragm for breathing. And once that can't get a signal, you suffocate and you die. That's what Stephen Hawking had all those years. He had some real special medicine to keep him alive that long. My mother didn't last more than a year with that uh, illness, unfortunately. But she knew. She knew what was up. My mother knew. And my father, he's crazy, man. <laughs> he is crazy, dude. But he put that work ethic in me I never forget that day he called me in the room when I was 12 and he said, you got to get a job. You got to pay rent a hundred bucks a month. And I'm not going to buy you any more school clothes. I'm not going to buy any more school supplies. You got to go out there and get it. And so luckily back then the Miami news was hiring people from the age of 12 to 16 to go sell newspaper subscriptions. So a guy would come in a pickup truck and pick us up. This is the early eighties now. And uh, he would take us out and he would literally take us to a block and say, square this block. That means go door to door to every single house until you get back to this corner and, and stand there and don't move until I come and pick you up. You do that these days, everybody's in sex trafficking, kid tra you know, kidnapping. You're going to have a million Amber Alerts on your phone. You can't even do that nowadays. Back then, no seatbelt law. You just hop in the back of the pickup truck. You go out with the, with the, with the uh, we call him a coach, even though he was a boss. We call him a coach and he would just drop us off. We'd go around knocking door to door. Sir, ma'am, I'm, I'm with the Miami News. I'm trying to win a trip to Key West. That was our big pitch. We're trying to win a, a trip to Key West uh, by selling these newspaper subscriptions to the Miami News, blah, 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 blah. And eventually at the Miami News became defunct. I think it ended up getting bought out by the Miami Herald. But needless to say, it was a great opportunity for me. I learned a lot. I learned the art of closing. I learned how to persevere. I became the top salesperson for 
uh, the, the, the program, the company, out of all the kids in my particular group. And I won that trip to the Keys and I went down to the Keys. And that's when I saw something totally different. When I went down to the Keys, it expanded my mind because I went down there and I saw mansions. I saw, well, to me, they were mansions. They ain't mansions now, but they were mansions to me because they looked like houses, four or five bedroom houses. They were built on these um, stilts because I guess it floods a lot down there, but they were all new and they were all so beautiful and painted all these crazy nice colors, nice cars on the ocean. Some of them on the sand where you can come out of your house and walk right onto the beach and go right into the ocean. And I was like, wow, people live like this? And I knew phew, my, my mind just expanded and I knew I was destined for other things. I wasn't going to remain in my current situation. That was just temporary. I knew it. And I told my mom, I remember that day, she saw me standing in front of the, the picture window, looking outside, just staring. And she said, what's wrong, son? And I said, I don't belong here. I knew it. I didn't belong here. I knew when I was able to sell my toys for money door to door and sell those subscriptions and everything else I was doing to generate money, I just knew it. I said, I'm going to save myself. I am my own savior, period. I never fell for that old crap about somebody's coming to save me and I got to beg for this savings and somebody's going to come and help me and all that kind of stuff. I threw out my own lifeline to my own self. I let my higher self throw the lifeline to myself down here. And I grabbed onto that thing and I held on tight and I didn't let go. And along the way, I hit all kinds of bumps and bruises and sidebars and you know, blind sides and everything else you could think of along the way. It was a bumpy ass road, but I made it. I made it. I'm here. I survived. I'm a survivor. I am a survivor. I made it. And now I can look back and I can see where I came from to where I am now. And that's why I'm always reaching out to be of service to others, to help people. You know, programs and things that I'm involved in that you guys aren't even privy to that you don't even know. Things that we've done, give, buying houses for people. I mean, you have no idea the things we've done. It's just crazy stuff. A lot of it's not even publicized. But we do it because it's the right thing to do when you realize where you came from. Where you came from, it's, you know. And one of my biggest goals is to go back to the oldest hood that I lived in, the most dangerous one that I lived in, to be able to go there and buy up a couple of blocks and begin to implement a specific type of change in that city. That's the ultimate goal. That's the ultimate goal. But anyway, guys, thanks for hanging out with me tonight. I appreciate y'all. Thank you for uh, spending the time with the Epic of Gilgamesh Tablet 3 and Tablet 4. Tablet 5 and 6 is a little bit more interesting, a little bit more to break down and discuss in, in there. From time to time, they do get a little repetitive. That's the, that was the writing style of the day. But uh, Tablet uh, 5 and 6 will be a little bit more interesting when I come back and read those to you next time. I'm going to try to get those done. I have to go. I have to fly to L.A. to film the Anunnaki series. So you'll be seeing a lot of behind the scenes coming very soon. You'll see some behind the scenes as I'm on set filming the new Anunnaki series, Anunnaki Ancient Secrets Revealed. I'll be starting uh, out that way on Monday, filming Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'll be filming the entire season, the first season, eight episodes of the Anunnaki TV series in a Hollywood studio. It's going to be mind blowing. The studio, I'm, the studio that I'm filming in is the studio of my dreams. You'll see. I'm fully immersed in this set. It's a fully immersed set. Uh, so it's going to be, it's mind boggling how this is going to look. And uh, I'm really excited about it. Um, the entire series is written by me, which is beautiful. And I got some special guests coming on. I have Matthew LaCroix and I have Eric Von Daniken. He's flying all the way from Switzerland just to come be in my show. So shout out to Eric Von Daniken. He'll be here. He'll be there. He'll be meeting us out there, rendezvousing with us out there in LA for a few days. Looking forward to seeing my good friend, Eric, spending some time with him, having a couple of nice dinners with him and his 
uh, and his business partner and assistant, Ramon. And of course, Matthew LaCroix will be there as well. We're going to have a great time. And uh, this Anunnaki series finally, finally is underway. And uh, it's going to be produced and released in Regal Cinemas. So we're going to release every episode in a different Regal Cinema around the United States. And I'll be at the cinema doing the live premiere, and I'll speak for an hour. So I'll give you a one-hour lecture. We'll premiere the actual episode like a movie on the IMAX screen, and then we'll do a live Q&A right there in the audience after the show ends. So that's going to be friend. That's going to be uh, phenomenal. And I'll be releasing the, the, the dates of the tour dates and the sites and the actual locations, the, the theaters that we'll be in. We'll be releasing that tomorrow. Okay. Nothing in Canada yet. I see some people asking about Canada. Nothing in Canada yet. We just for right now have the Regal Cinemas in America. After it airs on the Regal Cinemas in America, a couple of weeks later, it'll end up on Forbidden Knowledge TV, where you'll be able to watch it there if you're a subscriber. That's it. Either you can watch it live and in living color on live premiere and hear me speak and ask, ask me questions. Or you can wait until it comes out on Forbidden TV, but I'm pretty sure a lot of people want to come see it live in living color. All right. Anyway, thanks y'all for tonight. Uh, I appreciate y'all. And don't forget all the links to what I talked about, the Turkey tour, the Egypt tour, the Forbidden uh, Knowledge Investment Opportunity, as well as uh, our books, all in the caption of this video or in this audio. All right. Anyway, I'll catch y'all later.